fanatics, how are you doing? It's Sunday. You know what that means? True crime story time. Yeah. (laughs) I might be late, but better late than never, right? So, I am Cindy, and if you like true crime, and you like diamond painting, please do hit that subscribe button come join me on my channel and uh yeah i upload true crime on sundays most sundays i do my best but i am very very busy um i do also own a diamond painting company and we've got so much going on so much going on uh we have a very very special release tomorrow monday at 8 p.m. here on my channel i go live on mondays i'll be doing the grand reveal there very very exciting um i've also got a collaboration tied in with that kit too so dun 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 how you been are you all good um i hope you've had an awesome week and um yeah i hope you've had an awesome week i've got a a gruesome true crime uh i know last week hit you all pretty hard it hit me pretty hard uh i had to not only get through the whole true crime it was really horrific um i had to then listen to it again to edit so yeah i struggle with words (laughs) um names and places i can't i i don't always know the correct pronunciation of them and um yeah plus if my kids come in or whatever then uh obviously i stop talking because it's gruesome um i'll be mum for a minute um and then i get back to the true crime and uh yeah last week was rough it was really really horrific really tragic and um i would say it wouldn't it won't be this it won't be as gruesome but it is true crime um so let's get into today's episode sorry before i move on you probably all know this kit already this is lollipop daydream and hello sharon I am awake, but I am doing my true crime. Um, Just put me a message. So, yeah, I... um, All true crime is is gruesome on some scale. I think when we listen to it as much as we do, or we research into it as much as we do, or I do, for you guys, as well as myself, um, you kind of become a little sanitized i think is the word but last week hit me really rough it, it was similar to the sylvia likens i think i said that and that stayed with me this week but we are going to be talking about joe ball aka the alligator man so let's get into today's true crime Please do grab whatever you are working on. Grab yourself a drink and uh yeah, let's let's dive into this. Okay. Anyone driving along Highway 181 just south of San Antonio, Texas could easily miss the tiny town of Elmendorf. I hope I'm saying that right. Today The town is home to less than 1,500 residents, but in the 1930s, there were only 600 people living there. The Balls had been a prominent family in Elmendorf ever since it was founded in 1885. Frank Ball grew cotton in the area and prospered during the Great Depression.
by buying real estate when it was dirt cheap. Frank and his wife Elizabeth had eight children, most of whom became important figures in the tiny community. One of the children was head of the local school board, another became a mayor, another worked as the town's postmaster and yet another was the head of the church. But none would end up being more well known as Joe Ball. Joe was a large man known for his explosive temper and his way with women. As a young man, he was the first in the area to enlist in the army during World War I. Just after he returned from war, the United States entered prohibition, making it illegal to produce, import, transport or sell alcohol in any form. Like many others at the time, Joe saw an opportunity and became a bootlegger. Throughout the 1920s, Joe drove around the area of southeast Texas, selling his homemade whiskey out of a 50-gallon barrel in the back of his truck. Through the years, Joe became known as a surly drunk that liked to gamble, fight and take risks. He was large and he was tough. You did not want to be on the wrong side of Joe. He was good with a pistol too. Some said he could shoot a silver dollar in mid-air. Throughout the 1920s, he went through two wives and had fleeting relationships with several young women. When Prohibition ended, the market for his moonshine whiskey dried up. Joe, the ever opportunist, opened a small tavern just off Highway 181 called The Sociable Inn. But the locals knew it simply at, <coughs> excuse me, as Joe's place. The small roadhouse saloon became popular as a hangout for both locals and thirsty travellers. It was known for its rowdy atmosphere, player piano, poker tables and cheap beer. But the main attraction were the beautiful young waitresses and the five alligators that Joe kept in a cement pond behind the building. The alligators became a roadside attraction for Joe's place. As part of the bar's Saturday night entertainment, Joe charged bar patrons to watch him feed them scraps of meat, live cats and dogs, any sort of wild animal he could get his hands on. Young boys often snuck around the back of the tavern and peered over the fence to watch the carnage. Joe treated his employees poorly, particularly if they were black. But one employee, Clifford Wheeler, stuck by his side for years despite being scared to death of him. Joe hired Clifford, who was in his early 20s, 
as a handyman to do random tasks around the tavern and any sort of air quote dirty work he may need taken care of. Clifford did whatever Joe told him to do. If he didn't, Joe would shoot at his feet, making him dance until he did what he was told. Joe wasn't particularly good looking, but he was persuasive. He was able to find scores of young, beautiful women who were eager to work in his tiny saloon. If they didn't mind the rough patrons, they could make more at Joe's place than in larger cities such as Houston, Dallas or Corpus Christi. Joe led a strange but comfortable life, but he had one problem. He couldn't seem to keep his waitresses. They just kept disappearing. Ever since Joe opened the tavern in the early 1930s, his young waitresses would come and go. Some would last a few months, while others would be hired to wait on tables, only to disappear without a word a week later. It happened so often that many of the regulars at the bar would make jokes that maybe Joe was feeding the girls to the alligators. Little did they know, they may have been on to something. In the late hours of May 24th in 1932, a man surprised Joe as he was carrying what seemed to be a woman's body. Joe was dragging the body from a bedroom in the back of the tavern to the alligator pit behind the building. When Joe saw the man, he pulled his gun on the man and snarled, beat it. The man, scared to death, did as he was told, but not before Joe threatened him further. He told the man that if he ever told a soul, he would kill him, his wife and his three children. The man and his family left Elmendorf in fear of their lives. In 1934, 25 year old Minnie Godhart took a waitressing job at the tavern. Big Minnie, as she was nicknamed, had a hard edge and no problem handling drunk bar patrons. Jo liked her style and they started a relationship. Minnie and Jo dated for three years but Joe always had girls on the side. Joe was also seeing another girl at the tavern named Dolores Goodwin, known to her friends as Buddy. During a bar fight in the spring of 1937, Joe had thrown a broken bottle at a drunk patron and inadvertently hit Dolores. The bottle gouged her face from her eye to her neck, leaving a prominent scar. Despite the accident, Dolores continued seeing Joe behind Minnie's back. Minnie, however, knew about the affair. By the summer, like so many other female employees at Joe's place, Big Minnie was gone. 
Joe told his employees and bar patrons that Minnie had left town in a hurry, leaving all of her clothes behind. Again, the joke started. Joe fed poor Minnie to the alligators. He explained, however, that she was embarrassed because she was pregnant with a black man's baby. He claimed Minnie left town to avoid the inevitable small town gossip. That September, Joe married Dolores. It was his third marriage and as a wedding gift, he told her his dark secret. He had murdered Minnie so that they could be together. He confided that he didn't feed her to the alligators as the men in the bar joked. He had simply shot her in the head and buried her body in the sand dunes in Ingleside, Texas, near Corpus Christi. After just four months of marriage, Dolores was in a horrible car accident. She was lucky to be alive, but the accident had severed her left arm. Once again, the town spoke joked that Joe had thrown her into the pit and the alligators ate her arm. Dolores was good friends with another young girl at the bar, 22-year-old Hazel Brown. Dolores had a hard time keeping Joe's secret to herself and told Hazel that he had murdered Minnie. The news didn't seem to bother Hazel, despite their close friendship and knowing that Joe was a killer. Hazel and Joe started a relationship. Joe fell in love with the young, beautiful brunette and by April, Dolores, too, had mysteriously disappeared. A few months later, Hazel was gone too. The local sheriff's department grew understandably suspicious of Joe. The joke of the missing girls had gotten out of hand. It was happening far too often to be a coincidence. Authorities spent the summer of 1938 looking for Joe's wife, Dolores. On September 23rd, Wow, it's the 24th today. On September 23rd in 1938, a farmhand noticed a horrible stench coming from a greasy five-gallon barrel behind Joe's sister's barn. The seal on top of the barrel couldn't stop the stench or the flies from swarming around it. It was obvious that something was dead inside. But the sheriff's deputies arrived the following day. The barrel was gone. Sheriff's deputies suspected the barrel had contained a body and that the jokes flying around town about the missing girls from Joe's place were starting to seem less like jokes. The first person they wanted to talk to was Joe. At his tavern, Joe told the sheriff's deputy who he was friends with that he didn't know anything about the barrel. Joe's sister, however, confirmed that the barrel had been there the previous day. That evening, the two sheriff's deputies went back to Joe's place and informed him that they would need him to come with them to San Antonio for further questioning. Joe agreed and asked if he could first have a beer 
and close up the bar for the night. The deputies agreed and followed Joe into the bar, where he cracked himself a beer and took a hard swig. He then rung in a no sale into the cash register to remove the money, but instead reached under the bar and pulled out a forty five caliber pistol. The deputies followed suit and pulled out their revolvers. Joe briefly pointed the gun at the deputies, then, without blinking an eye, turned the gun on himself and shot a hole into his own chest. With Joe still on the floor behind the bar, investigators searched the area around the alligator pit. On the edges of the pond were bits of rotten flesh and hair, while a nearby axe was covered with blood. Unsure if the blood and hair were human, detectives began questioning employees, starting with Clifford Wheeler. Do you remember him? The right-hand man? Clifford, a young black man, had been afraid of Joe for most of his adult life. But now that he was gone, he was quick to talk to police. He explained that the missing barrel behind Joe's sister's barn had contained the body of Hazel Brown, not his wife, Dolores. Although she and Joe had been dating at the time, Hazel had met a man at the tavern that she fell in love with. He was a normal man with a normal job that led a normal, respectable life. Like most young girls, she wanted a husband, kids, a house with a white picket fence. That wasn't going to happen as long as she worked at a rowdy bar with drunken fights and an alligator pit. Hazel told Joe she was leaving him and leaving the bar. She said if she if he she said if he didn't let her go, she would tell police that he killed Minnie. She also suspected that he had killed Dolores. Joe didn't take too kindly to the threat and exploded in anger. Clifford watched as Joe bludgeoned Hazel to death with the butt of his pistol. At gunpoint, Clifford helped Joe dismember her body with a saw and a bloody axe that the deputies had found earlier near the alligator pit. Joe and Clifford placed her body parts into a 55 gallon barrel and stored it behind Joe's sister's barn. The body, however, hadn't been fed to the alligators as the officer had suspected. Clifford explained that he and Joe later drove the barrel just a few miles out of town and set up camp near the San Antonio River. By campfire light, they dug a grave and emptied the barrel of body parts into the grave. Her clothes and her severed head were burned in the campfire. Clifford led authorities to the dig site where they unearthed two arms, two legs and a torso. In the ashes of the campfire, they found pieces of teeth, jawbone and bits of skull. Although Clifford couldn't explain the disappearance of Joe's wife Dolores, he knew what happened to Big Minnie. Sixteen months earlier, 
Joe, Clifford and Minnie had driven down to the sand dunes near Ingleside to swim and bask in the sun and drink beer. Clifford explained that it was an otherwise normal afternoon picnic until Joe pointed out a bird to Minnie. She then turned her head to look at the bird. Joe shot her in the head. Joe explained to Clifford that he had gotten her pregnant and he, quote, had to kill her to shut her up, end quote. That evening, he and Joe dug a hole in the sand and buried Minnie, who had been pregnant with Joe's child. Clifford went on to tell police that Joe was responsible for the murders of several more young women, possibly as many as 20 many of which he claimed were fed to the alligators. Although there were plenty of missing women, there was very little evidence to prove more than two murders. Three days after Joe shot himself in the chest, Clifford took detectives to the sand dunes where he and Joe had buried Minnie. Clifford drew a large circle in the sand and said, quote, Miss Minnie is right down here. End quote. Dozens of people gathered around the sand to watch while the labourers dug, hoping to catch a glimpse of one of Joe Ball's victims. After nearly a month of digging, they got their wish when the rotten corpse of Big Minnie was pulled out from the sand. Two weeks later, Joe's wife Dolores was located alive and well in San Diego. She had been arrested for vagrancy after visiting her sister who lived there. Dolores had nothing but good words to say about her husband. Quote, Joe was a bootlegger and a pretty good man. They had him all wrong. He never fed anything live to our alligators, but legend is strong. Why I am lost why I lost an arm in an automobile accident. And people used to take one look at me and say, Joe put her in with the alligators. I do know this. Joe never put no people in that alligator tank. I used to get in that tank with the alligators myself and clean it. I'd just push them aside with a broom. They wasn't mean. And anyway, alligators won't eat human flesh. It's sweet and they don't like sweet meat. Everybody knows that. End quote. When asked about Minnie's murder, Dolores said, I was living with Joe then, and I guess you might say he killed her for me. Just before we got married, he told me he'd taken her to Corpus Christi and killed her. He said she wouldn't make us no more trouble. He was drinking and I just couldn't believe him. So I went ahead and married him. Minnie wasn't around anymore. Regarding the murder of her close friend, Hazel Brown, she told reporters, I didn't see it, but Cliff told me about it. He and Hazel kept throwing it up to Joe about Minnie. She said he'd killed Minnie and now I was gone, so he must have killed me too. After a while, Joe hit her with his pistol and I reckon that killed her. Then they cut her up and buried her 
and tried to burn her head. I sure liked Hazel. When the police searched Joe's home, they found dozens of love letters and explicit photographs from many of the girls who had gone missing. One letter was from Big Minnie, she, where she wrote, I will break you and Dolores Goodman up if it's the last thing I do. I know I may be killed, but who cares? End quote. After Joe's death, the unidentified man that had moved his family away from Elmendorf returned to tell police his story of witnessing Joe feeding a dead girl's body to the alligators. For his part in the murders, Clifford Wheeler was sentenced to five years in prison, but released after serving two years. After his release, he opened a bar in Elmendorf similar to Joe's place, but without the alligators. The five alligators behind the social, sociable inn were donated to the Brack, Bracken, Brackenridge Park Zoo in San Antonio. And there you go. Joe Ball. A disgusting, despicable human being. It's it's so sad. I think, personally, I think he did feed people to the alligators. Um, and then when the uh, jokes were becoming more and more common, he decided against it. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, it's not something you kind of hear very often, is it? But there you go, you guys. As always, please do leave your thoughts and comments down below. Um, yeah, I, I love interacting with you on my true crimes. And, um, I mean, wow. Five alligators, huh? In a cement pool around the back of the pub. Don't see that much these days. Wow. Uh, there you go. Uh, please, please do interact with me in the comment section. And um, I will be seeing you next week. What kit will I be working on? This is uh, Lollipop Daydream by Shalayarius. Um, it was very, very popular with... DIY Moon Shop and I kind of reached out to the artist and said hey any chance I can have that one because I got asked for it quite a few times so yeah I'm working on it um me and Reese are working on this together he done a, a tiny section on the bottom uh but I've been working hard on this kit today and I thought oh we need a true crime so yeah, it's now quarter past seven. I'm not going to edit this. I don't think I made too many boo-boos. So I'm just going to upload it. Um, raw footage. <laughs> yeah, trust me, I never really do that. Um, I do mess up quite a bit. So there you go. Please remember to stay away from alligators or very rowdy pubs uh don't get suckered in by the landlord perhaps if they're a bit dodgy uh, but as always guys stay safe out there and i will be back on sunday with another true crime i enjoy my sunday evenings spending time with you and um yeah 
please remember, I am live tomorrow, Monday, 8pm, and I will be showcasing um, a new release. It's a very, very special one. It's not like me to just do one release, but that's the plan. Um, yeah, I'm very, very excited to see your reactions to this kit because I think it's going to either fly out the door or end up in a lot of wish lists. I'm just saying. Okay. Stay safe out there. Bye.